Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Ortho Ninja Academy session on ballistic injuries. And here in the UK, and uh, my colleague here uh, with me, uh, Sharif, was a, a colleague of mine in Manchester, now working in Jeddah in uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And uh, some things you need to know about Mr. Sharif is that, you know, he uh, is, uh, uh, he came very highly recommended to Manchester. He had done the fellowship with Myerson, so he's very well qualified. He was very popular and knowledgeable consultant to, uh, in Manchester. And he was a great colleague and a great teacher on courses. So uh, we appear to have lost him. Rahil, can you uh, hear me? Amir, I can hear you. I seem to have lost you on camera, but thank you very much for those kind words. I'm pretty excited. So uh, looking forward to this uh, great uh, session as well. I seem to we seem to be having slight issues with the IT tech here because uh, I can't seem to see you on camera, but I can hear you. So maybe uh, I will whilst I'm presenting, you can log out and log back in or vice versa if we lose each other. And I'm quite uh, happy to see a few friendly faces from England uh, in the uh, attendees today. Quite a few of the ones uh, from back in Manchester, so hello to everyone, both, both in Saudi and in uh, Manchester. Great. Carry on, Amir. So, um, so by going through a case, just to sort of set the scene and to give you an idea of the sort of the subject material that we're going to cover, and in order to uh, try and sort of facilitate everyone's involvement. What we'd like to do is to just to run some polls, everyone just to give uh, their opinion, and those will be running at the right hand side of your screen. And we don't know who's answered uh, which uh, qu uh, question in whichever way, and it, it's entirely anonymous. And what we want is for people just to be honest, to give their uh, opinion, and then we'll go through the, the answers uh, so there's there's no embarrassment or anything like that. We just want you to take part. So uh, would you like to start off with the first case? Sure, Amir. So let's get started with a, a case. And hopefully some of the questions which are going to come up in this case are going to give us a flavor of things to come in Amir's talk. Um, I'm quite looking forward to certain things like primary injuries, secondary injuries, quaternary injuries. What is uh, the velocity of a bullet? How does that impact injuries and things like that, which Amir, who has a lot, large amount of experience in these kinds of uh, combat injuries is going to talk to us about today. So here's our first case. We've got a 23 year old who was shot in his right leg as they are. Uh, it was an isolated injury and this was his clinical picture and his x-ray. He can't obviously bear weight. And uh, we've been in the uh, emergency room we've done the ATLS protocol and we are presented with this so as we can see this is a small possibly a one centimeter wound on the anteromedial aspect of the shin and the first question which we're going to pose to you today and we'd like you to answer is bullet wounds bullets are inherently sterile because of the amount of heat that they generate and wounds are also inherently sterile because the bullet sterilizes the wound. Is this statement true or false? So the poll has come up on the right hand side of your screen. For some of you who possibly have that section closed, just click on the top right and you'll start seeing the polls. And we'd like you to answer that question. Uh, Amir, what are your thoughts on this? Whilst we give the audience a chance to answer well, this question. I think I think it's a really interesting question because uh, it's something that you hear quite a lot. Now, uh, I've been uh, all these books behind me. A lot of these are on military surgery, and I um, I found this book. Uh, I don't know if you can see me, but I found this book from 1908. And no, that's not uh, how old you are, right? Uh, repeat. Oh, <laughs> that's harsh. Harsh. God. I'd always thought that you know it, it, the vast majority of people have chosen false uh, because uh, these wounds are not sterile. And uh, what's interesting is that I always thought that was from Hollywood. That was because people had watched too many movies. But the, this book from 1908, so it's pre-World War One, 
it states bullet wounds are clean. But then in the next paragraph, it says most of the people who die uh, in the aftermath, not so not dying immediately from their wounds, but they die in the next month or two, they die from infection. So I think really there's the answer that you know these wounds are not sterile. And um, if we don't treat them appropriately, then it's going to, it's going to risk that it's going to kill our patients. Absolutely. And it's important. This is the idea of having this kind of a session where we're trying to collaborate and bring about best practices from across the world. In England, we've always been taught that gunshot wounds, open fractures, well, open fractures is a different kettle, but gunshot wounds or bullet injuries are dirty. We've got to wash them out, debride them, and you know, then the antibiotics kick in as well. Now, there was a paper recently in Injury, which was presented this year, uh, published this year, which stated otherwise, this was uh, the experience from uh, Joburg and Cape Town, where in South Africa, we know there's a huge amount of gun violence. And they seem to suggest that the yes. guidelines are diametrically opposite to what the British guidelines are, which is if it's a gunshot wound, and it's essentially just hit the soft tissues and missed the bone, or hit a section of the bone, just a unicortical fracture, as they call it, and most of the bone is, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, structure is intact. You don't necessarily need to wash these out. What do you have to yes. say about that? Um, I, I think obviously they've got a great deal of experience in South Africa with uh, gunshot injuries. Um, but um, I, I would uh, uh, still follow the UK guidance for my practice because um, in their, because they're so experienced, they might be able better results but in my hands and you know following UK practice what I'd be worried about is that 10% of patients who are going to get an infection so I would uh, be cautious I, I think you know it, it's better to it, for me personally in my practice it's better to be cautious and to try and play it safe because I don't want to rely on luck to uh, give my patients the best outcome I'd rather that I had something to do with uh, their outcome. Okay. Great. Let's move on and see. This wound here is one centimeter wide, okay? As per the Gustilo Anderson classification, we would grade this as a one, a two, or a three. So we're posing this question to you. We'd like you to answer this. What do you think, Amir? Uh, Amir, we seem to be losing you uh, back and forth on the screen. Uh, just as uh, possibly the, just check your streaming speed, but we can hear you fine. Yeah, I'm um, carry on, but just yeah. give your heads up. I don't think I need to log out. I'm just going no, no, we'll to carry, carry on. on. If you'll, you can hear me, that's fine. So, Amir, what would you call this? Most of the audience here seems to say it's grade three. Seventy nine percent of the audience is calling this a grade three uh, injury. Uh, as we know, the Grading yes. done post debridement, as we discussed in the open fracture uh, session last week. You'd agree with that? We've got 20% saying grade one. Absolutely. How would you counter that argument that this is uh, not a grade one and the majority of the audience has got this um, grade three? So uh, I, I agree with the majority of the audience that um, Gustillo Anderson, although it talks about a grade one being one centimeter wound, um, that's uh, if it's a gunshot injury, it's automatically a Gusillo Anderson three because of the high energy nature of the, uh, the, the the wounding. And because there's like to be soft tissue stripping associated, if there's a broken bone, there will be soft tissue stripping as well, which is just not visible because of the size of the entry hole. So I, I think, you know, it, it's definitely a grade three. OK, yeah, I think we all agree with that. So right. here's the next step in this saga. There are two wounds. There's one entry and one exit wound. How do we clean them? Do we clean the wound with a large syringe? So basically, do we just flush that wound from the entry or the exit wound out through the other side and uh, then close the wound once all debris has been cleaned out? Do we clean these wounds with a large syringe and leave the wound open? Uh, and Amir, I think you're pushing that bowl across, right? And do right. we extend the wound, debriding any non-viable tissue, and then close that wound? Or do we extend the wound, 
debride non-viable tissue, remove any loose bone bits, and then leave that wound open. So those are our four options we have. And we're going to give you a moment yeah. so, to answer that. Um, Amir, thoughts? So, I Amir, mean, there are two questions here, aren't there? The first of all is, how are you going to lavage the wound? And the second question is, once you've cleaned it, is it safe to close that wound? Um, and uh, in all uh, the, the, talk, the talk we had on open fractures last week, we discussed how it was necessary to extend a wound, to excise a wound, to uh, debride it by opening up the bone like a shotgun. Yeah. Uh, um, taking out any loose fragments. So I think you know, just flushing it with a syringe is really not an adequate way of cleaning the wound. So I discard the answers that uh, involve just using a syringe. And then uh, the second question is, should we close the wound? And we've already talked about how these uh, wounds are inherently uh, contaminated. So I wouldn't want to close a wound over potential contamination because I'll just end up having to go back in and my patient's going to suffer more uh, if they get an infection. So certainly for the first uh, uh, debridement and probably second and third, I would leave the wound open uh, again. Yeah. So. I think it's worth I'm, digressing I'm, here. Looking at the poll. You're going, going with four, are you? Sure. Let's see what the audience seems to be answering. Yeah, I'm going to we've go got, with four. Uh, we've not got too many people uh, who've answered this question just yet. They're probably mulling this over. We've got 27%. Oh, sorry. We've got about 15 answers. Yeah, 67% agree with you and going with four, which is extend, debride, remove loose bits of bone and leave it open. 25% uh, seem to want to close the wound primarily. Uh, as, as Amir is saying, this is probably not a great idea because these are high energy wounds. They'll have debris, micro and macro debris. Remember, parts of the bullet might be in there, bits of shrapnel, parts of clothing, which we may have missed at the first debris mod, no matter how aggressive we've been. So it's always a good idea to sort of take your time, go back in for 24, 48 hours, depending on this wound and uh, get it cleaned up. Uh, it's worth probably digressing here, Amir, and just talking about the trajectory of the wound from an entry and exit wound point of view. So when we see an entry wound and an exit wound, it's probably worth in our mind's eye going through where that bullet might have or that, uh, you know, shrapnel piece of shrapnel might have passed through. Has it gone through hollow viscous organs, you know? Uh, and all these things sort of have to be looked at because potentially you can have bullets that have pierced small bowel and then gone and lodged into the uh, yes. femur in the thigh or they could have gone through large bowel and mm -hmm. then gone and lodged in the pelvis of the femur. Is there a difference between the small bowel and large bowel? Because the flora is different. A large bowel wound by default is a contaminated wound. So these are all things which we might have to think about, isn't it? We seem to have... Amir, if you can hear us, I think you're having... I think, Amir, you're having problems with your, yeah, you're back on, carry on. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about this in the ballistic section of the talk, but essentially uh, the bullets do tend to follow a true path, so they go in a straight line. Um, so you do, it's important to visualise what structures the, the bullet may have uh, been through. And uh, quite commonly, um, a military uh, round will break up into several bits and it's important that you try to identify different tracks that the, the, the fragments may have gone down. Okay, so let's say we've done what most of the audience has suggested. We've aggressively debrided that wound. We can't see any more non viable tissue. Everything looks healthy. How much contamination do you think remains in the wound? 1%? 5%, 10% or 50%. So we're going to give you the uh, a moment to answer that and let's see where we are at. So this again brings us back to the fact that it's probably best to have a second look. There's a bit of a hint there for all of you. Um, it seems like 50% of the audience has answered so far. We're going to give them a moment. So that extended uh, linear wound on the top picture there, that's gone along the fasciotomy lines. Just to reinforce to uh, to our uh, colleagues that 
any wound that needs to be debrided, we connect it to the nearest fasciotomy line. And in this case, that's the posteromedial fasciotomy line that it's been connected to. So we've had most of the audiences answered. 50% are going with 50% risk of contamination. 47% or half are going with 10% contamination. Uh, so the right answer there is there's a 10% risk of contamination, even if you've been very aggressive in your uh, wound debridement. Uh, Amir? I, absolutely. You know, I go with 10% as well, because no matter how good a surgeon you are, no matter how clean it looks, there will always be some contamination along tissue planes that you've missed and you won't be able to clean out. And quite often uh, in wounds, what you find is that you will debride and you go back to what you think is healthy tissue. And then the second time you go into that wound, you will find that the tissue which looked healthy before, that surface is now necrosed. So you've actually got more necrotic tissue to to bride away and because it's necrotic it's more likely to um, um, develop infection as well so that's the, the basis that you're going to go back in and do a second or a third debridement so that after the first debridement you've got 10% left after the second debridement you've got 1% left after a third debridement you've got 0.1% of the contamination so, uh, left. Mr. Shreve is going to go for gold here this question is posed to him what's the risk of osteomyelitis uh, after your uh, aggressive debridement? Well, again, you know, even in the best of hands, you know, in the literature, the uh, risk of osteomyelitis is about 10% for ballistic wounds. It's 10 points to Gryffindor there. Okay. Final question before we uh, let Amir uh, take over and uh, give his talk. So we've done our debridement. We've given it a good thorough clean. It looks nice and healthy now. How are we going to fix this definitively? Okay. Are we going to nail this? Are we going to put a medial plate? Are we going to put an anterolateral plate or a circular frame? So here's your, here are your options coming up. We'd like you to have a go at answering that. So remember, now the wound is clean. Okay. Amir, I know you're, uh, you swing both ways. You, you fix internally as well as you use circular frames. Uh, we're going to give yeah. the audience a moment to answer the question. And there is no right or wrong answer here to everyone. Uh, it's what works best in your hands. There is a slightly, uh, you know, there's a swing towards one favoring the other possibly. 50%, um, oh, we've got a tie here. We've got 50% saying <laughs> that they're going to put a nail in here and 50% who want to frame. So this was a high energy injury. It was a gunshot wound. Uh, we've had to take it back to the uh, operating room more than once to debride. Uh, in your hands, Amir, what would you do? Um, well, if we just go through the answers, um, th we've got a wound where we have um, soft tissue stripping and we're also worried about infection. And if we were to apply a medial plate or an anterolateral plate, then I think that would involve a lot more soft tissue stripping, a lot more devascularization of the bone, so for that, that reason, I wouldn't go for those two options uh, as a means of managing this particular type of injury. Now, it, it does depend on horses for courses, you know, what, what people think works best in their hands. I, uh, I, I can say that I've seen a fair number of ballistic injuries that have been managed with intramedullary nails. And my concern from my experience is that if you're one of the 10% who has an infection, if you put an intramedullary nail down, then there's a risk that you're going to spread that infection up the, uh, the long bone that the nail is in. And I would be concerned that there's a risk that I could actually make my patient worse by putting down an intramedullary nail, although that's a very common treatment and I've seen it done and I've seen it done and it's worked and the patient's been fine. But because of my experience of having seen a lot of intramedullary nails getting infected after ballistic trauma, I would go for a circular frame. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the reason is that if, if you put a circular frame on that mechanic, at the same time, you're not putting metal. Okay, we seem to have lost uh... soft. 
Okay, so I think what uh, Amir can is hear me? saying is that, yes, we can hear you now. Uh, so basically, to summarize what you've just said, circular frames probably safer, but it depends, as you said, horses for courses, what works in your hands. But what the big take home message here is, if all you see, if all you have is a hammer, then everything you see is a nail. So that shouldn't necessarily be the case. If you think this fracture needs a circular frame, if you get that feeling and you don't frame, pass it on to someone who does, because you'll end up causing more damage to the patient by nailing it just because that's what we are comfortable doing. Um, what about the literature, Amir, about using antibiotic impregnated uh, nails? Do you think that has a role in these kinds of uh, nasty injuries? Well, in, in theory, the, the, if you uh, have an antibiotic coated nail, then that should address this very problem of risking infection being transmitted along the nail. But what we do, you know, there's nothing actually in the literature to definitively show that there's no infection. And one of my concerns is that if you have a coating on a nail, that coating might be very brittle. And when you're putting down uh, uh, a nail through a very narrow medullary cavity, we don't actually know what's going on underneath. So the coating may be being stripped yeah. off. Um, so, um, I, I, like I said, you know, the circular frame still, even if an antibiotic nail was available. Okay, great. So that's the, uh, that's just a quick uh, case we wanted to discuss with you before we uh, hand over to uh, Amir for a talk. Uh, Amir, can you hear us? Because you seem to be flitting in and out of the presentation. I can, I can hear you fine. Can you okay, hear me? So as, as long as we can hear you, we're, we're good. We, we'll carry on. If at some point we lose you, I'm going to just message you so that you can uh, log out and log back in again. Now, uh, for those of you who okay. don't know uh, Amir Shoaib, Amir Shoaib has a lot of experience with war injuries. He's served in the British Territorial Army. He's been in uh, active uh, combat zones uh, in Bosnia. He's, he's been in the Middle East as well. And uh, he's, he's very active with uh, the use of frames, internal fixation, and has a large amount of experience, which uh, we're looking forward to him sharing with us for this often complex and challenging uh, group of injuries, which as civilian surgeons, not all of us have uh, access to. I know there are a few military surgeons in the attendance uh, audience today, and I'm sure you've got some thoughts. What I'd like you to do is, uh, every, any, uh, any one of you, please use the chat option and... Uh, ask the questions as we go along and we'll direct it to our speaker. So Amir, over to you. Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you, we can't see you, but that's okay, carry on, please. That's fine. So thanks very much, Rahil. Um, Rahil's hiding his light under a bushel here because Rahil um, was uh, present in Manchester in 2017 when we had to respond to the Manchester Arena bomb. And uh, I've got to say that there were a few surgeons that I, I was actually on call that day, so I was leading the orthopedic response. And there were a few people that I um, called in, and number one on my list was Sharif, uh, as well as uh, Praveen Sada, who now works in India, and uh, um, uh, Anantha Benesson, who works, still works in Manchester. So um, Rahil actually does know a fair bit about ballistic injuries, but I'm going to take you through what we might consider the rudiments. And the subject matter that we're going to cover is basically things like uh, gunshot injuries um, uh, from handguns and from rifles and from shotguns. I think I think and we need to address to talk the a elephant bit about... in the room. Before uh, Mr. Shoaib carries on, he's just come up off a war zone injury, so you see the cut on his, uh, uh, above his eyebrow. I, I I had a tumble walking in the Lake District, so we believe you. So yeah, so I have to have a cut on my eyebrow. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to talk about bomb injuries as well, uh, and I'm specifically going to talk about my experience, not just from Manchester, but also from uh, the Syrian civil war uh, and Gaza as well. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about. Now it's a nasty business. But I'm therefore they're designed to injure and kill you know to cause harm to other human beings now there are laws
metaphors uh, for uh, the way that people are supposed to behave in uh, combat. They're called the laws of armed conflict, and there have been several treaties uh, um, which are internationally sort of recognized for the humane conduct of the art of war. The problem is that when a war breaks out, the laws of armed conflict go out of the window and people behave very badly. So um, the first thing to do is probably to talk about bullets. So in your picture there, you should be able to see a cross section through a bullet. And uh, this is actually a, a cartridge uh, which uh, contains the bullet at the front end. And the bullet is normally made out of lead and it's covered with a uh, copper nickel or steel coating. And then that sits within the cartridge. Now, at the bottom of the other end of the cartridge to the bullet is um, primer. So when the you pull the trigger, the uh, uh, firing pin hits the uh, cap and that ignites the primer. When the primer is ignited, it causes a little explosion and that causes the powder inside the bullets to explode. And when uh, it's a chemical reaction, And it's the gases which are going to push the bullet out of the end of the cartridge, down the um, barrel of the pistol. And as it comes out, the, the rifle is uh, This particular bullet, if it's got uh, a full, it's called a full metal jacket, uh, which is a, it's a famous. Uh, if you want to know where the reference comes from, Stanley Kubrick. Mm -hmm. But full metal jacket is considered in war to be a legal round. Uh, now, uh, rounds, and they don't have uh, a full coating of copper and nickel or steel around the bullet, and they behave in a very different way. Now, you'll hear people talking about low velocity and high velocity injuries. Um, that's perhaps a little bit of an old fashioned way of uh, describing them. We now tend to talk about the energy transfer. So how much energy gets um, uh, transferred from the uh, bullets to the body as it causes damage. So I suppose uh, the next thing we need to ask you is what's more important uh, for the kinetic energy in a bullet? So the kinetic energy is the energy that you know, is going to be uh, transferred from the bullet into the uh, ash, what causes there to be more kinetic energy in the bullet? Is it the mass or is it the velocity? So, we're giving, giving so you that, that question is being pushed to yourselves. We're giving you a moment to answer that question. Uh, Amir, this boils down to physics, doesn't it? Absolutely. We'll, ju we'll just give them a few more people yep. who want to choose one of the answers. We're remaining fairly static in terms of the number of answers now. Yep. So, so we've had. So you're absolutely right, Rahil. It's all about physics, and this is something that we've known for a long time. Kinetic energy is half mv squared. So. Amir, may I suggest something whilst the slide is if you, on? Uh, if you just don't mind just logging out and logging back in, because we seem to be uh, losing you. I'll just carry on the discussion till you log back in. Is that okay? Okay, I'll log out and come back in then. Thank you. So as Amir was saying, it's all about the uh, energy that is generated from a bullet. It's not the mass or the velocity, but in your exam scenario, for example, in the uh, training programs, if you've got to pick one, it's the velocity which is oh, you see me now because uh, we can hear you now i think you're just fantastic carry on i'm back in can you hear me we can hear you now i think your connection is a bit tenuous but we, we can carry on it's it's fine okay so um we've we've uh, i've mentioned already that energy is uh, half mv squared and it's all to do with how fast the bullet is coming out of uh, the muzzle. And so if you look uh, 
at the uh, two rounds in the bottom left hand corner the are uh, the smaller one is a 2-2 round uh, so that's 0.22 of an inch which is about you know just over five uh, and a half millimeters and the second round the much larger one that's a, a different cartridge but actually the size of the round is just over five and a half millimeters five five six um uh bullets now the interesting thing is that even though the bullets may caliber and the much different the uh reason for the different size is the amount of powder so because of the uh, uh greater amount of powder it's able to uh, velocities squared it means that it's not just the speed but also the energy that uh, is, uh from the uh the round which is going to be that much higher now it's not actually projecting very well but the the nine millimeter per pistol um is going to generate a speed of 353 meters per second and the energy is 519 joules if we uh look at a rifle which is it has a smaller round at 762 which is fairly typical for uh, an AK47 then its speed is uh, as the, as it leaves the muzzle is 715 meters per second and its uh, energy energy is 2045 joules now the M16 uh, fires a 5.56 round and the speed uh, is uh, more uh, 975 meters per second um, but uh, the uh, the energy is 1854 so even though it's a much smaller bullet, um, it's speed and so with it uh, but the velocity is a little bit more on the final energy So for what we're going to do jacket and just need to get up uh, a video. So I don't know if you can help me here, Rahil, by putting up the video for the full metal jacket. Yeah, okay. So the you can see the bullet coming in from the left hand side of your screen and it goes in a straight line first of all. And what it's doing is creating a cavity within the body. So let's go back to the presentation again. So yeah, I'll do that in a moment. So, Sorry. Oops, wrong one. Yeah, give me one moment. So that round, it tends to follow a straight path, first of all, and that's about sort of 12 to 15 centimetres. So the first 12 centimetres that that bullet is within the body, it tends to go in a straight line. But as it is um, uh, body, the bullet, uh, although it's The tumble instead of going in a straight line the the resistance causes it to start going sideways so it's going in the same direction but it's going sideways and it actually imparts a lot more energy to um, the body then and what happens is that it creates a cavity within the body and it first of all uh, creates a temporary cavity so it's much bigger so it sort of creates a cavity which then collapses back down in on itself so there's a temporary cavity and there's a permanent cavity uh, and that's all reflected in the um the energy uh, sort of being transferred to the human body now that was the full method so, Amir, basically what you're what uh, what you're telling us is that it's not the uh, 
either the mass or the velocity, although velocity is a little more important for a, for a bullet or the caliber, it's the amount of energy that is dissipated within the body, depending on what structure it hits. Absolutely. Correct? So if you have a bullet that goes through a, a part of your body, say your arm, that is less than 12, 15 centimeters uh, long, it may go through your bone, but it will follow a straight path. If it stays in your body for more than 12 meters, then it will start to tumble and you'll create this cav temp and as well as so and that's when it's transferring a lot of its energy. So it's possible to have a low energy transfer if it goes through a part of the body that's less than 12 centimeters wide. Now we're going to move on to a different type of bullet. This is a semi jacketed uh, bullet. And this was developed uh, by the British Raj in India. Um, and as I said before, there were laws of armed conflict and this type of bullet was deemed as being inhumane by the Hague Treaty and it was banned immediately. But it's still quite widely used and it's used in law enforcement and in the US they call it home defence. Uh, and the, we're going to have a look at the ballistics and that will explain to you why the law enforcement authorities use it. So if we whoops, if we have a look at uh, the next video. Yeah, I'm going to bring that up. To so you in a it should be. So, So we saw that video there right. of these jacketed. Right. I didn't I didn't see that video. Is it possible to play it again? Sure, okay. Right, so in this video, this is this is what the bullet looks like, and it's not got a cover, it's no copper and nickel over the end of the bullet. And then after it's been through the human body, that's what it looks like. So if you compare it to the full metal jacket, which broke up into two, this bullet has basically become completely flat. And the reason it's become completely flat is because it has transferred all its energy to the body. So there's uh, as well. Have you seen that one already for the semi-jacketed? The uh, the one where the, through the uh, That's bomb. right, yeah, so. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna share that with you. So, so that's the one that's getting yeah. flattened out as it goes through the... Absolutely. So what you can see with uh, the semi-jacketed is that um, there's no small tunnel at the first 12 centimetres. It actually, as soon as it hits the body, it transfers all its energy and it creates a large temporary cavity. Um, so it doesn't actually go all the way through um, as the full metal jacket uh, round would do. And that's why it's used by law enforcement so that it doesn't um, if they shoot somebody, um, then it doesn't cause the, the round isn't going to someone behind them. It's got more stopping power and it's just going to it's going to stay within the first subject that it hits rather than going through and causing damage to other people. So here's a, a good example. So this, this is a man. Uh, who was shot in his chest and you can see on the chest x-ray on the right, middle of his chest but what's really interesting is the CT scan on the left and you can actually see um, the damage that this round has caused within his chest going from front to back so um, you can see that there has been some cavitation and there's damage to the uh, tissue of the lung, which is far wider than the track of the bullet. So this just indicates how much wider the damage is. And if you look at the CT slice from underneath, what you can see is uh, the round, which is sitting next to the transverse process uh, of the spine. About there, yeah. Right at the bottom. Absolutely, just at, just at the, at the very bottom there. So that bullet is sitting next to his spine. So let, let's 
have a think about this poll. Um, if you have a bullet or shrapnel within the body, should it, should we be taking it out? So. So we're going to push that ball to you. So it's it's like that dictum in orthopedics, isn't it? There is a bone. I must yes. fix it. There's a bit of shrapnel. Should I take it out? So okay. the vast majority seem to be going with uh, false. You don't need to take out shrapnel. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what do you think, Rahel? So uh, I'm in agreement. If if you have shrapnel which is visible while you're debriding, you take it out and get rid of it but we don't have to go in further, deeper and further. We might end up causing more damage. Uh, and particularly when it comes to shrapnel, it's not necessary to take it out. With bullets, could it be controversial? Or do the same laws apply? Well, exactly the same. So if, uh, if it's something that's visible and accessible, then we should be taking it out. But if it's buried somewhere and there's a risk that you're going to cause more damage by trying to retrieve it then clearly it's not worth retrieving it so that bullet was lying next to the transverse process and the risk is that if we go in from the back to try and remove that we're probably not going to achieve very much apart from cause more damage so i, I would uh, uh leave that alone okay so if you've got any questions in the audience please feel free to post them in the chat box uh, and we will take them up as we go along. Okay, so, so let's move on to the next. Now, we discussed this, right. isn't it? Where the we, and the that's right. Time. But this is, is what I'm going to talk about in this slide is essentially um, what happens with a shotgun. So. So just like with a bullet, you can see that primer there and uh, there's powder and there's also some wadding. But instead of having a bullet at the front in this shotgun cartridge, we've got these little uh, steel balls. So um, when the shotgun uh, uh, is fired, um, the powder is going to explode and it's going to push out the wadding and it's going to push out these uh, the, the little uh, ball bearings from the front of the shotgun. Uh, and sometimes even the cartridge itself can be ejected too. So you can, but- Shall we have a look at the uh, ballistic video on that? Yeah, so if we look at the-, the um, At very short range, the shotgun transfers a lot of energy The video coming up yeah it was i'm going to replay that again so this is oil i take it that's the video which is showing the dissipation of energy from a shotgun and we can see there's a massive amount of uh, cavitation occurring there absolutely and and spray it's not going to have that much energy because it's going to lose its energy fairly quickly but at short distances it's you know a massive amount of energy that could be transferred to the body you know, it can easily you know, take off a body part or actually you know, destroy the, the the body tissue so it's unrecognizable so here's an example of um, a shotgun injury to uh, a bone so here we can see um, a femur and you can see all the uh, the little ball bearings within the soft tissues and you can see that there's a fracture so uh, the energy has been transferred to the bone it's broken the bone and that fracture is going all the way actually down to the um, metaphysis at the bottom of the femur so yeah in terms of these penetrating injuries from uh, uh, from uh, uh, rifles and uh, uh, shotguns. I think essentially the, the take home messages are that and 
that if we debride them, we're not going to get rid of 100% of the contamination. So it's essential that you don't close a ballistic wound on the first debridement. To protect the soft tissue, spanning the um, uh, fracture with uh, an external data will actually stabilize the soft tissue as well as uh, stabilizing the bone. Now, there are lots of controversial areas. So last week, when we talked about open fractures, you, you talked about the tug test. Um, and you talked about, uh, you know, how if a piece of bone was loose, but it had soft tissue attachments, you'd leave it behind. Um, with a ballistic injury, I, I'd perhaps be a bit more aggressive and I would be more tempted to remove it because there's more likely to be soft tissue stripping. And another thing you mentioned last week with open fractures is that there's actually plenty of evidence that using local antibiotics is effective as a, a means of uh, treating um, these types of injury. Um, and the one that you know we've tended to use is something called stimulant um, calcium sulfate, which you can leave inside the soft tissues and it just dissolves over six weeks and releases the antibiotics that you put inside it. So it's an uh, wound and then about 12 centimetres uh, long, this, the whole track of this wound, and that's why we've got such a small uh, exit wound. Can you hear me, Rahil? Yes, you were breaking up initially, but we can hear you now. Carry on, Amir. Okay, we seem to have lost Amir there. I'm just going to message him and then we can carry on with this. Uh, I'll, I'll carry on. So the question we have is, this is, so as we, as uh, Amir has said, we extend, we debride and we lavage the wound and then stabilize with an external fixator. And here's the amount of uh, dead bone that was fished out of this okay, case yes. before the X fix was applied. Amir, can you hear us? Okay, so I was just talking to uh, uh, to the audience about the yeah, amount of so, dead bone that was excised in this. We've followed sort of that same mantra, sort of uh, extend the wound, as you said, for open fractures, excise the wound, um, lavage it, and amount of um, the bone floating around. So, so obviously the, the message which is coming across is that uh, it's an open fracture, but you've got to be far more aggressive with these and yes. fill out bits of bone which might have a tenuous hold on soft tissue. Um, there is a possibility, of, there is a distinct possibility that these uh, bones will shorten. Yeah. And we look later at how... Uh, but that's just one this. example. Now... We're going to talk about uh, blast injuries. Mm -hmm. um, so, as I've said, you know we have uh, had experience of blast injury um, in Manchester and uh, elsewhere, and there are different ways that we uh, blast depends on the mechanism uh, that's involved in causing the uh, injury. So, uh, there's we talk about primary. Uh, blast injury, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. So let's move forwards. And I just want to give you an idea of what it looks like when um, a bomb falls. And I want you to remember that uh, with this particular type of uh, bomb, this is actually quite an amateurish bomb because it's um, made by uh, a barrel with. Um, TNT Allah and um, also with nails and bolts and bits of loose metal. Allah uh, Allah and this is a Allah barrel bomb, which is very typical. So I'm seeing the video as we go along. We've lost your, your screen, but we're seeing the video. It's very so this is a 
Russian helicopter. Allah and the Russians Allah have actually refined Allah the barrel bombs by putting tail fins on them, which makes them spin in the air and makes them a bit more stable and a bit easier to aim. But it's still a very crude device. And you know, if you think about the uh, bombs that you professionally captured bombs munitions that are being dropped, they are far, far worse because um, they are engineered to cause maximum harm. So let's move back to the presentation. Ya Allah. Okay. Ya Allah. And so what happens when uh, a bomb explodes is that it's a chemical reaction. It produces uh, vast amounts of heat and gas, and that uh, gas will expand. And when it first expands, it expands so quickly, it actually s sends off a supersonic shock wave. And that shock wave is moving outwards incredibly quickly at like three to nine kilometers a second now it's it's hard to conceive of just how um quick those blast waves are moving and what it tends to do is to cause damage um in hollow organs so where there's a, a junction between a solid and an air-filled organ uh, and it's the interfaces where there's most injury so if we move to the next the will show us uh, a blast wave the video it's actually from the, the bbc it's the slow mo bbc slow motion video we're going which video are we and in slow motion it's actually possible to make out this blast wave now anybody who's watched the uh the explosion in beirut will have seen the same kind of thing so if you look very carefully Although there, you can see the gas is exploding and expanding, you can see that there's a clear film, and that's the shock wave moving outwards much quicker than the gases. And that's moving you know, between three and nine kilometers per second, which is absolutely phenomenal. So we'll go back to the presentation again. So just to give you a sense of the uh, damage at the, at the bomb site at the epicenter, you've got 16 million psi pressures going through a pound inch, square inch. And it just takes 60, not 16 million, 60 yeah. uh, psi to cause a fatal injury. Right. So it's and a phenomenal. And this of, shockwave uh, can cause injuries that you can't even see. So what we know from the Manchester bombing is that we saw people who had neurological injuries who had normal MRI scans, but they still had the signs and symptoms of a stroke. And that was um, basically caused by the shockwave uh, damaging the brain. Similarly, you can get shockwave uh, uh, resulting in gas formation within the abdomen. It doesn't mean that there's been a perforation, but you can find gas. So, As well as that, um, we've got secondary blast injury. Now, the pieces of metal that you can see there in the top two pictures, these are what we call improvised shrapnel. So if you have ever seen a uh, grenade, you can see that it's designed to fragment and produce um, pieces of metal you know, moving away from the explosion at very high speeds to cause damage. With th this uh, type of shrapnel, where uh, it's improvised, they're just everyday objects which have been packed around explosive. So uh, the top picture is just a, a simple nut, and the middle picture is what we might call incidental shrapnel. So it's uh, a piece, might be a zipper from a, a clothing or from a bag. And then at the bottom, we can see a little piece of bone. And what can happen is that those people who are uh, closest to the explosion, sometimes it, it's possible that people's bodies are disintegrated and their bodies are then 
propelled outwards from the site of the explosion at very high speed and their bone can then penetrate other people and be a type of biological shrapnel. So, I mean, just to uh, sort of clarify for the audience, the primary blast injury is That's the right. injury that occurs due to this, this massive supersonic wave, correct? That causes collapse of organs. It's and from uh, uh, the secondary blast injury is or parts of people being blown apart from the center of the explosion and penetrating other people's bodies. Okay, so actually parts of the bomb or parts right. of shrapnel, okay. like nuts and bolts and things like that, which penetrate other people. So let's ask a question. We, we've talked already about how um, these are contaminated injuries. So let's have a poll. What's the best way to give antibiotics for these open wounds and open fractures? Okay, so we've got a large number of audience who's clocking in, okay. going both for intravenous we'll and We'll just give a few more seconds for people to answer. I think... Yeah. So would you do anything different with antibiotics in a standard box, standard open fracture versus a uh, ballistic injury? with the duration of antibiotics given following definitive uh, fixation. That's last week closure. when we talked about open fractures, um, there's very clear evidence is uh, effective um, and it gives you much higher doses at the site where you want it to be compared to intravenous antibiotics alone. But because there's that 10% of contamination that might have traveled down tissue planes and we might not be able to access locally, I think it's a good idea to give intravenous antibiotics if you can, as well as local antibiotics. And that's what the UK guidelines are. So how long would you continue intravenous antibiotics? Once that's a, again a controversial area. Fixation? We're not really sure about what the right timing is. Um, certainly, uh, I, I think it's worth continuing intravenous antibiotics for two weeks and then perhaps converting to oral antibiotics for another four weeks, but giving a, a good six week uh, course of antibiotics. So tertiary blast injury is caused by uh, effectively the blast winds. So the, if you can imagine the speed in a hurricane might be up to about 300 miles per hour. The speed of the blast winds from an explosion, especially high explosive, can be 10 times as much as that hurricane, 1,000 miles an hour in a small area close to the explosion itself. Uh, now, this isn't something that we saw in the Manchester bomb, but that may be because the bomb was too small or the people who suffered the tertiary blast injuries were all the ones who were close to the bomb and they were killed. Um, and it, you know, th there may be multiple reasons why we didn't see it, but it's something that I have seen in uh, bombings, uh, especially in Syria. And it's something that really haunts me even now. It's one of the most horrific things that I've ever seen. And, um, you know, it is amazing what one human being is capable of doing to another human being. So the tertiary uh, blast injury is when people are flung and they hit pillars. Or That's posts right. So it's, it's basically caused by the blast wind. So it's either that, that blunt injury. picking people up in the blast wind and blowing them, uh, either removing parts of their body or blowing them into other structures, or knocking down structures, and they then fall down and cause crush injuries. And then there are what's described as quaternary blast injuries, which are other types of problem which may occur as a direct result of uh, the bomb, 
um, but you know, are not to do with the, the bomb fragments themselves. So if uh, burns are caused, if there's crush injury, if there's uh, inhalation of noxious gases, or if it stimulates um, angina or asthma attacks, then that's known as a quaternary blast injury. So one thing, I, I, this is an interesting question, you know, of all the people who are going to be involved after a bombing, which surgical department is going to see the most casualties? So I would hope that everyone's interested, you know, who's going to be the busiest? <laughs> So we'll give them a chance. We're all orthopedic surgeons here. So there seems to be a general bias towards orthopedic surgery. So well, if we had to talk through that, thinking aloud, we'll give a few more moments for the audience. But I, most of the people who have... I can hear you fine. Yeah, carry on. All right, can you hear us? Okay. Okay. So do you reckon cardiothoracic C is the least? Because most people who have a blown up aorta. Yeah. So will, you know, will, the chances will are actually is that if you uh, have an injury with shrapnel to the head or the abdomen or the chest, you're probably less likely to survive. So everybody's given their answer now. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, we've got fifty-seven percent. The majority have gone with orthopedic surgery. It's a close okay. call. And forty-three percent. So have gone this is the evidence. So this is uh, from the Journal of Royal so Army Medical Corps, looking at um, who survives. So who's going to survive after they've uh, had a penetrating trauma? And what this graph shows that this is something that hasn't changed. Um, if you get an injury to your head or your chest or your abdomen, you are much more likely to die. The ones who survive, one So, I mean, we seem to be losing your audio for a moment. I'm just going to reiterate the point you've made that if you, that most people who have a head, chest, uh, or a neck injury tend to, or a, an abdominal injury don't make it, they don't survive. So, the answer to that would be that the orthopedic surgeons see the most uh, uh, of the trauma because the limb injuries That's are the ones right. which survive yeah. and tend to come okay. into hospital before they bleed out. So, orthopedic surgeons should expect to be busy after a, a bombing. So here's an example of a patient who's been injured mm -hmm. and it's there's improvised shrapnel. And what you can see uh, all around the body, uh, there are little lumps of metal. And these lumps of metal are um, nuts and bolts which were packed around explosive. So there's an open femoral fracture so that the metals hit the bone and it's transferred energy to the bone and caused a fracture in the femur and the tibia and the hands um, and you know for patients who uh, are injured in this way we need to get a top to toe uh, ct scan because that's the best way of identifying where all the injuries are we're going to talk about damage control in a few weeks time but damage control surgery is the way that you're going to try to um, treat as many patients as you can in the shortest possible time. So for the bone injuries, we want to stabilize them by um, using monolateral external fixation. So we've got, we've stabilized long bones, which will also stabilize the soft tissues. We're going to debride the soft tissues and we're going to use our local antibiotics as we described before. For definitive treatment, we've moved from the uh, monolateral external fixator to an Elizaroff type of fixator uh, which will allow our patient to weight bear and it, it also you know it, we've spanned the knee but we haven't actually 
stop the knee from moving so hopefully we can allow the knee to carry on uh, mobilizing um, we've managed the infection by putting in local antibiotics and they've had a gastroc flap and a split skin graft over the top to uh, manage the soft tissue defect now there was some bony injury and this has been treated with shortening of the bone so the parts of the bone which were not viable have all been removed and if you have a look on the left you can see uh, how much damage here and if you look progressively to the right you'll see that we've removed uh, all the loose bits of bone so that it has a better chance of healing so there's more bone to bone a left hand picture granules of antibiotic um, uh, pellets that we've put in to uh, the, the fracture as well. Here's another. So I just want to focus yeah. the attention. You may have mentioned this, but you see, so if you just go back to the previous slide about how you flattened out the uh, proximal end of the tibia in that uh, intraoperative. Okay, so, uh, so basically the problem get, was um, that uh, there were big spikes of bone. And if those big spikes come together, then we're actually getting very little bone contact. But by flattening the ends, we then actually get a lot of bone contact. And that gives us a much better chance of healing. And uh, I'm pleased that, you know, in this case, that was a, a successful uh, uh, tactic. So it's managed to get the bone to heal. And we can be confident that we can stretch the bone um, later to get the patient's uh, bone length back. But, um, you know, in the short term, it's far better for the patient to have all that dead bone on that, all that non-viable. Here's another case, so another open tibial fracture. And you can see on the left-hand picture, all those little um, gray circles which are in the soft tissues and that's protecting the bone and it's protecting the soft tissue flap which is overlying it. So we're getting delivery of antibiotics for six weeks after we've uh, closed the wound. And this is the, the patient uh, himself. This is from his uh, Instagram account and you can see him with two external fixators. Accessories there. Yeah, so plastic surgeon uh, from Manchester, Jason Wong, who you and I both know, um, who uh, spent a week with us at uh, Manchester Royal Infirmary, um, these patients together, and it was uh, very successful, I believe. Now, I'm going to give you a few examples about why I'm not so keen on. Uh, internal fixation for these types of ballistic injuries and that's because unfortunately in the Syrian conflict I've seen far too many people who've had internal fixation and unfortunately it's resulted in the patient suffering a lot more because uh, if you look at the far right picture you can see this is a, a, a tibial uh, plate which would normally be used for a tibial plateau fracture and unfortunately, the skin has broken down because it's infected. And you can see dead bone at the uh, front of the tibia as well. Now, in the middle picture, you can see uh, a plate which is um, Amir, are you still there? We seem to have lost you for a moment. I'm just pushing a poll to the audience while we get uh, Amir back. I'm just going to message him. So it's uh, it's okay for Amir to say it's okay for Amir to say he's going to put a circular frame on, uh, but a lot of uh, us may not be comfortable putting a circular frame on. So in the real world, when you're in a disaster zone or you're 
uh, a military surgeon um, who's possibly in a far off area, we, we are left with what we have. So how many of you would be our internal fixators and how many of you are external fixators here? I'll give you a moment to answer that question and I'm just gonna message uh, Amir as we uh, of the audience who'd go with an external fixator. Uh, I think that's a wise option, but we need to understand that not all of us are comfortable with external fixators, and it's probably uh, wise to refer it on to people who are used to managing these uh, complex injuries. I'm just going to carry on with the uh, presentation uh, until uh, Amir joins us. So here's, uh, here, these are uh, obviously the complications that we see. Amir, are you back on? Your help? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, so, I just moved one slide whilst we were waiting. Um, so the point I was trying to make was that if you put on a monolateral external fixator, then it's possible to temporize it, and you can then the patient can travel and wait until they've had more uh, uh, the possibility for definitive surgery. But if you put an internal fixation and they're getting discussing there, we we were just discussing there. We were just discussing the option of internal fixation versus external fixation, and I pushed a poll to the audience there, because um, quite a large number will not be comfortable using circular frames. So, is there a role for monolateral or biplanar Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. external fixators to okay. treat these differently? As, as a temporizing measure, so that you can get the patient to, um, you know, a place where they can have more definitive treatment. No, as a, as a definitive measure in places where people might not be comfortable using a circular frame and they're in, you know, in, the, in a war zone um, in the middle of nowhere. In that instance, would we go with an internal uh, fixation or would we go with uh, an external fixation option with possibly a biplanar? I, I would always uh, prefer the external space. fixator um, just because it means that there's less risk of causing more harm to the patient. Okay, so um, in this slide, um, this little girl uh, is nine years old. She's the same age as my daughter. And uh, it was uh, very difficult for me to try to treat her uh, because of the very severe injuries that she'd had. Uh, and uh, I think there was a role for her to have um, an external fixation for um so i've seen unfortunately a lot of complications because of the use of an internal uh, fixation and it may be that um i'm just seeing the a, a small minority but unfortunately it's it's enough to cloud my judgment so here again is um another patient who's had a lot of internal fixation and there's not really very much bone left uh, around his elbow for anything to be done in the future so th i think we're we're not able to help in this uh, case as well as all those surgical issues there are other non-surgical issues that we need to think about so if there's been biological shrapnel then we need to think well is there a risk that the patient could be uh, uh, could have uh, been inoculated with hepatitis or HIV or any other disease. So patients need to have some kind of immunization. Um, there's a risk of having injury to uh, a patient's hearing, and that might be something that's immediately apparent, or it may be something that... Um, Summary, 
safely say that ballistic injury is not clean and you shouldn't be closing wounds at the first sitting. You need to debride these wounds pretty aggressively. My advice is avoid internal fixation if you can. Um, having had experience from several conflicts that um, putting metalwork near a potentially contaminated wound is just a, um, a recipe for disaster. I personally would always go for a circular fixator because that's, you know, my practice. Thank you, Mr. Shoaib. Thank you, Mayor, for, for a very uh, enlightening uh, 30 minutes. Uh, unfortunately, the audio was a little poor but, uh, on occasions, but I think we all got the gist of the message there. We're going to move on to a couple of quick cases just to uh, spice things up a little here. As uh, Amir was talking about uh, ballistics uh, and blasts, we're, we're going to go with this one. This is a 33-year-old man shot in the street by a shotgun and uh, a wound on his left thigh. So here's the question. What are our priorities for treatment? Which is the top priority? Is it breathing? Is it circulation or the airway? So we'd like you to answer that question. So the vast majority have gone with airway there. Uh, All right. So there, if you've got thoughts? somebody who has a penetrating injury, especially in war, actually, it's uh, the, the risk of bleeding is the, the biggest cause of death. And uh, generally, if they've got an airway injury, there's not much you're going to be able to do about it. Or if they've got a chest injury, you may not be able to do very much. If they've got a circulating in, circulation injury and they're bleeding out, that actually is, is the one time where you might be able to make an intervention that could help. So instead of going for an ABC approach in this for penetrating injuries in war, especially it's worth going for a CABC approach and um, trying to arrest bleeding uh, by putting on a tourniquet or by using uh, direct pressure or using hemostatic agents in order to try to control the, breath the, the bleeding. And then, because that's a fairly rapid treatment, you can then, if you put on a tourniquet, it should take you maybe 20 seconds and then you can go back to look at airways and then breathing and then circulation again. Correct. So the vast majority, 92% have gone with airway. But what we want to reiterate to you with this is that it's a CABC approach. So look at circulation first, first, then go to airway breathing and then come back to circulation. And the difference between an open fracture management uh, versus a gunshot or a ballistic uh, injury with an open fracture is that the use of tourniquets is used far more liberally in gunshot injuries and ballistics. Uh, and that's one of the most important factors that has reduced fatality uh, from uh, ballistic uh, injuries, the use of tourniquets, which we don't advocate in open fractures because we use direct pressure first, uh, all sorts of tamponade and go for tourniquet right at the end. That's your last resort in, in a box standard open fracture. Okay, so this patient, that's, this is the x-ray. He is hemodynamically stable. He's got an isolated injury to his leg. And this is his x-ray. His left femur has a butterfly comminuted fragment and a fracture to the mid-shaft with lots of uh, scatter from the shrapnel. So what are the injuries that we're worried about? Is it a nerve injury? Is it vessel? Is it compartment syndrome? Is it fractures or all of the above? So we'll go back to that x-ray. It's uh, pretty much in the center of the femur. You can see a few scattered uh, bits of lead in the pelvis. So 70%, we've got a few more who we're waiting to answer. The vast majority, it's a bit of a, uh, well, 40% seem to think it's the blood vessel which is at risk here. And 62% say all of the above. Uh, I think the right answer here is all of the above because you've got to be worried about pretty much everything, a nerve, the vessel, the compartment syndrome, and the fracture. Uh, as a side point, a mangled extremity is a descriptive term, but a mangled extremity actually is when three out of the four structures are damaged, whether it's nerve, vessel, uh, uh, the bone, or the soft tissues. If any three of those are damaged, that's called a mangled extremity. Uh, that's how we define it. 
So the vast majority seem to have got all of the above right. While you move on, he has no bleeding. Uh, there's no, you know, uh, vascular injury on the angio. There is no nerve injury. He does not have compartment syndrome. And now we're looking to manage the bony injury. So as we discussed, extend, deliver the bone ends, debride, lavage, and stabilize with an external fixator. What are we going to do with that uh, bone that is shattered? So we'd like you to answer this question. Excise it only and lavage. Add bone graft to the area. Excise the bone and add antibiotic beads to the wound and fill the gap. Amir, I know you've mentioned uh, in your talk what we should be doing. Let's see what, well, that's, that's pretty comprehensive. 100% so far are going with excising the bone, adding antibiotic beads and... Uh, and you know, I feel very satisfied that, you know, this is a big take home message that and I'm really pleased that um, everybody has uh, taken this on board now that, you know, that's what we need to be doing. Excising it and lavaging it is one thing, but we need to stabilize it. And we know from the literature that antibiotic beads um, help to uh, decrease the risk of uh, contamination and they deliver much higher doses of antibiotics locally than you would get from systemic uh, um, uh, administration. Absolutely, yeah. So we discussed this last week where the risk of osteomyelitis is reduced to about 6 to 7% in these kinds of injuries when you have local antibiotic delivery versus close to 25 to 30% yeah. through uh, systemic antibiotics. Okay, so here's another question for you. How are you going to fill that bony defect? Are you going to bone graft it? Are you going to use the masculine technique? Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the masculine, it's where we debride and we fill the, the gap with some cement and allow a living biological membrane to form around it. Then we go back later, open up that membrane, take out the cement and pack it with bone graft. Or are we going to bone transport with Elizarov um, with an acute shortening? So those are your options. We're going to give you uh, a couple of moments to uh, take your and time. And there is no right answer, answer again. You know, there, there, might, there are uh, different opinions. People would do different things. And um, it's, it's useful for us to be able to gauge how people uh, think about this. But so long as you can think about the plan long. of opinion. So there are people who've. So we're going to. So there's still a few people who haven't uh, chosen any, uh, any answer. If you can try and do that for us now. Just a few left. OK, so. So what do you think right here, you know, in terms of you know, the options, what, what's a safe option for a patient? So I think quite, uh, more than one option is safe here. So that's the first thing to uh, point out. Uh, I think masculine is an entirely reasonable technique. Uh, you could possibly pack some antibiotic impregnated cement in there to locally elute whilst that membrane is forming. Uh, bone transport with Elizarov, uh, obviously doable. Uh, acute shortening and then uh, staged lengthening yeah. is another option. I would probably go with, uh, sorry. So let's see what the audience has gone with. 38% have gone with bone transport with Elizarov, And 30% have gone with acute shortening. So I think either of those is, it's essentially what works best in your hands, what you're comfortable doing. Uh, I would, I've uh, been comfortable with the masculine because that's, that's how I've been trained. So I would probably uh, slap a uh, frame on and uh, you know, put some antibiotic loaded cement in there and come back later and bone graft it with a wire masculine. But uh, I know that bone transport or acute shortening and gradual lengthening at a second stage is perfectly reasonable. Mm -hmm. Let's see what you so, do in there. So he's had the Elizarov treatment and what you can see is that at the bottom um, is uh, because, because we've moved that segment of bone upwards, uh, we've done an osteotomy and we've grown about five centimeters of new bone and more proximally you can see that 
uh, we've brought the ends of the bones together and uh, that's actually nicely united now so that we can it's safe to remove the frame because the bone's nice and mature but unfortunately, unfortunately so did you do a huge shortening stage lengthening or did you do uh both of them at the so, same sorry, time could you say that again so did you acutely shorten it and then go back later and do that distal uh, femoral osteotomy, uh, corticotomy to lengthen, or did you um, do it all at once? I actually time? left a gap, and then we moved that segment of oh. bone. So as that, as we were as we were using the bone, deeply, yeah. it was also compressing it proximally as well. Yes. No. Yeah. So but this 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 patient's uh, had multiple infections because every single one of those little metal balls is capable that infective focus so several times he's come back to us even though his bone is healed up he's come back to us because he's had some small areas of soft tissue infection as well okay looks really good there. It's had good consolidation so here's uh the final one so he's had that treatment and now the knee is quite difficult to flex and extend passively. Uh, how can we improve the flexion? Physio, uh, lengthen the quadriceps, nothing. The muscle is far too damaged and scarred to, to do anything or release the muscle from the bone. So this is, uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, I'm not sure a lot of the audience will have had uh, uh, an exposure or experience with this. Let's see where, what they come up with. Okay, so we've had a bit of a split here. We've got 40... <laughs> so lengthening the quadriceps and releasing the muscle from the bone seem to be the most uh, uh, popular answers. And physio, well, there's, there's almost a three-way split between those. Physical therapy, lengthening the quadriceps and releasing the muscle from the bone. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with lengthening the quadriceps, it's quadriceps plasty, uh, which is quite a, a technically challenging and demanding procedure, particularly in patients like so, where there's a lot of scarring and the uh, quads are stuck down to the femur. What, what, what would you um, do, Amir? What I'd be worried about with lengthening the quadriceps is that although it might uh, allow the knee to flex more, and the quadriceps themselves may not be doing very much because there's the uh, the problem is that the they're scarred down so they've really glued down to the uh, femur because there's been so much trauma uh, and it's possible to if we can release the muscle from that uh, being scarred down to the bone that then it would actually allow the muscle to glide more smoothly and to uh, gradually allow greater knee movement with physiotherapy but you know there's no right answer here um i think that you know physiotherapy always has an important part um, with or without surgery uh, i think it's possible that lengthening the quadriceps might work and um it's possible that um just a muscle release might be enough uh, or it might be a combination of, of of different treatments what would you do and i think it's really uh, I agree with you, uh, but whatever surgical intervention we do, I think the surgery is probably just half the battle won. The cr crucial thing would be to have a, a CPM machine immediately post-op for a few days uh, to actually get that muscle moving. I think that's the last slide, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, that's the last slide from that. Do we have time for one more? We're going to go with one more case before we call it today. And we're going to give you about five minutes for any questions, five, ten minutes, if you have any uh, burning questions to uh, answer those. Uh, here is our case two. Okay, so here's a 38-year-old man uh, at home uh, in his apartment when a bomb uh, went off close by and he came in with an injury. Um, his left arm has been avulsed. He has a penetrating chest injury, as you can see in that x-ray there, uh, but he is breathing. Now, what are your priorities? Let's see whether we've got our message uh, driven home. Stop the bleeding, check the airway, assess his chest.
So we've got a few more left to answer between those three, but as we've discussed with ballistic injuries, the priority always is to stop the bleeding, not the airway. It's a, it's a modified approach to the ATLS where it's CABC because the patient might have catastrophic bleeding and before you've even gotten to the airway, he's bled out. So the priority is just get that bleeding stemmed and then move on to the airway. And the vast 70% seem to agree with, the, uh, with that there. That's, that's the principle for that. Okay, so his bleeding has been stemmed with C-LOX and direct pressure. Uh, so as we said, it's a CABC approach and the ABCs are stable. Uh, he's got no pneumothorax despite that shrapnel piece lodged in his mm -hmm. chest. And now Rahil, do you think it's, the, wor uh, it's worth talking about or. what uh, C-LOX is? Um, so, so, so people yeah, may not please, come across C-LOX, but C-LOX is it's, it's made from uh, a sure. chemical which is derived from uh, sea, uh, 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 fish. And what what it can do is it causes blood to coagulate, uh, even in somebody who's on warfarin, or if it's cold, it will still cause the blood to coagulate more quickly. So if you use Celox directly on a wound, and what we normally do is uh, have a roll of gauze, which is impregnated with Celox, and we jam that into the wound to try and get that to bleed, then we put direct pressure over the top. And... In this case, there's no room to put on a tourniquet, but if uh, the, if there was more of the arm left, then you would put on a tourniquet as well to try and stem the bleeding. Thank you. Okay, so here he is in the uh, operating room now. He's, he needs a through shoulder amputation. Uh, the question we've got for you is, how much of that muscle which is visible should be debrided? And your options are preserve all of the deltoid seen to make a flap so the joint is covered, excise anything that is damaged, and leave the wound open for reinspection in 48 hours, or remove all the shoulder muscles, chop them all off, and let the plastic surgeons fill the gap later. So we've got that uh, poll running. We've got a few people who've answered. So Amir, if you want to give us some practical tips on when we're debriding with ballistic or blast injuries, how do you know what muscle is viable, well, what soft tissue is viable? Besides the fact that it won't be, some of it won't be bleeding, that's obvious. But when you've got that doubt, that gray area, how do you identify which bits we so take out? Essentially what you're going to do is look at the macroscopic appearance of the muscle. So if it looks like a steak that you might buy in the butcher, and it looks you know, beautiful and pristine, then that muscle is healthy, it's not been damaged, and that's worth retaining. If it's all straggly and there are bits, of, and it looks like a, a raw um, muscle, then that is not viable and it needs to be removed. We, we, we lost it there for a moment. Do you want to just repeat that? If it looks scraggly, I think what you're trying to allude is if it looks like a hamburger, as you normally yes. say, or... Absolutely. Meat, so if, it's, if it, it looks like a, a mincemeat, then you're going to remove it. If it looks like it's steak, like it's pristine, then that's actually healthy. And you want to try and retain that to get your soft tissue coverage. OK, so coming back to our question, uh, excise anything that is damaged and leave the wound for reinspection in 48 hours seems to have had uh, the bulk of the. Uh, uh, I think we'd agree with that, wouldn't we? That's probably right. Yeah, we would agree with that. Okay. So we've got one final case we can quickly run through and then leave the floor open for questions if uh, people have any. Well, I think we've, we've done that one already, haven't we? We discussed this one. I think that probably was the last case, wasn't it? Yeah, case three. Okay. I, th I, think, I think we've done that one already. Is it? Yes. Okay. So yeah, we're, we're done with the cases. So I'd like to open the floor to uh, the audience for any questions you might have. Uh, please post them in the chat. And if you want to uh, uh, make a point, we'll open up the uh, microphone for you as well. Does anyone have any questions? We'll give you a moment. Whilst we're waiting for any questions, um, uh, Amir, what is the... Uh, so? Do you, do you think there's a big role uh, for uh, 
vitamin D. We, we talk about vitamin D a lot. We talk about vitamin C and albumin a lot as supplements. Do you think there's a role for any of these in uh, blast injuries or any supplemental biologics we might be able to uh, um, use? To, to be honest, I haven't read anything like um, uh, to um it, it's still an uh, evolving there are lots of things that we don't know yet um whether okay we we seem to be seeing some of your audio um while we're waiting for Amir to uh, pitch back in. We've got a question from Ayman. Uh, do we apply local antibiotics at first session of debridement only? Uh, the answer, uh, Ayman, is no. You apply at the first session. When you go back in and you think it's not closable, you can put the antibiotic beads back in again. Uh, and sometimes if you've got a defect which you just want to close and cover and then come back and uh, like the muscular technique, you can leave antibiotics in for about four to six weeks. So you can leave local antibiotic beads even after uh, definitive stabilization, just to allow them to elute locally gradually over six to eight weeks. Yeah. So I hope that's answered your question. Uh, if if it if it has, please uh, just type in yes. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? I mean, are you back on? Yeah. So I mean, when you put in local antibiotics. Even though it's going to last six weeks, you know, when you debride again, you, you're probably going to clear out what you've put in the first time and put some fresh antibiotics in anyway. Um, yeah. Okay. Do we have any further questions? So, Amir, just to summarize, top three take home messages for ballistic injuries. Uh, I think, Nev, please lay down for us. All ballistic wounds are contaminated until proven otherwise. Uh, number two, don't close uh, wounds at the first sitting. And probably number three, um, try to avoid internal fixation uh, uh, and use external fixation, as, especially at your first operation, so that you're spanning the bone and stabilizing it without causing any further soft tissue disruption around the around the fracture site and the wound site. There you have it. Uh, three top take home tips from uh, Amir Shoaib. I hope you found this session uh, useful. Uh, it's, it's fascinating to see these uh, quite nasty injuries and how we deal with them uh, on an evidence based uh, in an evidence based manner in a stepwise uh, algorithm. Uh, if if you're interested to have any further information, please uh, contact us. We're more than happy to uh, answer your questions. And next week, we're gonna be discussing compartment syndrome. And uh, the following week, we'll have damage control orthopedics to sort of round off our uh, trauma theme for the month. Uh, the following month, we'll be doing some foot and ankle, and then we'll be taking it each uh, uh, joint uh, month after month. So hopefully, if you've got any feedback, please do let us know. But I hope you've enjoyed your session and uh, learned yeah, a lot. Thanks, Rahil. And thanks, thanks for, everybody, Thank very for much. everybody for attending the, the webinar. Okay. Take care, everyone. Goodbye.